So I got to work with um, Disney Animation, Disney Live Action, uh, Pixar, Marvel Comics, and Lucasfilm on the Star Wars games on, on those projects. Worked on that for a bunch of years. And then I went to Warner Brothers and uh, we just made Hogwarts Legacy. So I, I kind of have always just been really obsessed with story and how you can actually change people's lives with telling a good story. You Hi everyone and welcome to our next Game On podcast. For those of you who are new to our episode, these podcasts are initiatives from Shrook Partners Gaming Vertical. And we try to record this podcast every week and we bring on excellent speakers and pioneers in the industry. If you would like to learn more about our program and the initiatives, please go to our website, which is shift.shrook.com. And you can learn more about our initiatives there. Great. And having said that, um, I'm very, very excited because today we have interesting episode where we will dive into the thrilling world of video games narratives. And um, we all love being immersed in those video games environments. And today we will actually look into what goes behind those narratives. And we are lucky because we have with us the lead writer who worked for 30 years in, in the gaming industry across different companies. Uh, so Adrian Drop here with us. And Adrian, would you like to introduce yourself? Tell us about uh, your experiences and would love to hear uh, about what inspires you when you write uh, stories for games. Okay, well, first of all, thank you for having me on your podcast. This is really exciting. Um, so I'm Adrian Ropp. I worked as a story artist and a writer in the entertainment industry for 30 years, like she said. Yeah, I'm definitely that old. And uh, I started off in animation because I actually, when I was a little kid, I saw the Jungle Book and I wanted to do that for a living. And so I actually started off in animation back when it was still hand-drawn. And I discovered storyboard artists was a job. And I started doing that. And then I ended up directing. I was assistant director on a film called The Velveteen Rabbit. And then I was the director. Uh, I'm sorry. I was assistant director on a film called The Princess and the Pea. And then I was director on Velveteen Rabbit. And then I moved over to Disney Interactive, worked with them with, on uh, a game that is very well known, which is Disney Infinity, that had the little toys that you put on the reader. And, and so I got to work with um, Disney animation, Disney live action, uh, Pixar, Marvel comics, and Lucasfilm on the Star Wars games on, on those projects. Worked on that for a bunch of years. And then I went to Warner Brothers and uh, we just made Hogwarts Legacy. So I, I kind of have always just been really obsessed with story and how you can actually change people's lives with telling a good story. You can influence their thought process and you can change, you can actually change culture with good words. And so I've, I've just always been really excited about that. So that's kind of what drives me. I, I'm trying to improve the world. Each time I write a story, I want to do something that's going to inspire people to greatness. Wow, that's very, very inspiring. So would love to explore those secrets of how you write stories and the narratives in this podcast with you. I'm also joined by uh, my colleague, Sally. Hi, Sally. Hi, Zebo. Can you hear us? Hi, everyone. Great. So I'm the uh, programs manager here at Shuruk Partners. Myself, um, Zebo, and Tara, who you've seen regularly on these episodes, uh, we run the gaming vertical here at uh, Shuruk Partners, which is um, one of the leading tech investment firms uh, out of the MENA app region. Uh, who has been looking into the gaming space over the past years, uh, incubating and looking into investing in the gaming um, space and happy to kind of always connect uh, and share uh, and knowledge with people like Adrian here. So super excited for today's episode as well. 
That's amazing. Thank you, Sally. Um, maybe let's start off with a question about what makes storytelling different than just a plot? Because I think there is this confusion that people just think that if you have a plot, it means you have a story, right? So what do you think? What makes a story and how do you define it? Uh, so you're absolutely right. They're different because a plot is this happens and then this happens and then this happens. And yeah. a story is something that you like. Uh, I think we all love to go to the theater to see a movie and just get lost in the story and pretend that we're not we're not even there. We, we're just pretending like we're the main characters in the movie and, and watching their journey and their struggles and things. And I think that's really what a story is. A story is something like an adventure. It's it's just this incredible journey that you get to go on and experience. And so um, what separates a plot from a story is the story has something relatable into it that talks about the human condition and things that we all strive for and wish for and struggle against. And so that's, that's kind of like the hallmark of a really good story is something that uh, really um, speaks to people on a very personal level. Yeah, I, I see that. And I think um, many times when we play games, right, for us as players, it's the feeling of uncertainty or the feeling that we have a choice when it comes to which action to take and what, what behavior to have. I think this drives players, but I was wondering from the point of view of the narrator or the person who actually writes the stories, who knows the beginning and the end, how do you give off this feeling of uncertainty and um, the feeling of agency for the uh, players? Yeah. So that's actually, I'm teaching a class about writing right now, and that's one of the big things that we talk about a lot. How do you give the player the autonomy to feel like they're telling the story, they're the main character, instead of like you do in a movie where you tell them what a story is and they have to just accept the decisions you make. And the wonderful thing about games is after you get used to writing for games, because I actually had a little bit of a struggle when I started working in games because I wanted to control everything. And when you work in games, you can't do that. You actually have to let the, the player control some of the story for you. And so it's, it's as simple and as difficult as creating options for them that make sense. You'd have to figure out what options they're going to want to see and give them to yep. them. That's I think that's uh, super that. interesting, uh, Adrian, um, kind of your approach towards it. I think because that, that sense of uncertainty today is actually what a lot of what drives the player and their decisions, right? Um, yes. And it becomes extremely significant when it comes to engagement, when it comes to uh, not just looking at player um, activity, but also overall the game and, and the essence of building a good IP as well. Um, so I love, I love, I love that approach, and I'm, I'm, I guess I'm curious, following up to to, to some of the things you said. Um, what was that journey like for you, kind of transitioning into writing uh, for games, right? And especially seeing a lot of a lot of how uh, games today are written. What were some of your key learnings um, as you delve deeper, working on some of these great franchises? I mean, by the time I started working in games, I was I was fairly good at telling stories. And so I felt like from, from the film perspective, I actually knew what I was doing really well. But then I went into games and you have to imagine it's just like art. You're given a toolkit of things you can use to create your, your art. And I went from having a screenwriting format where I could tell people what the adventure was to having a controller that I didn't get to hold. And so it was the first six months I worked in games, it was so difficult for me because I just kept saying, well, no, but I want the player to do this. And I'd have to say, no, I can't make that choice, but I have to let them make that choice. If, if you hand the player a controller and then they don't have any autonomy to make choices in the game, what a boring game that will be. Like nobody, yeah. it, it, won't, it won't resonate with people the way that it would if it was more interactive. And so it was about me figuring out how do I allow, how do I, how do I give the player the choices that they want, stay within a budget that is feasible and make it rewarding when they get the results? So in a movie, you have about two hours 
to sort of take them on an adventure, find a cool mm -hmm. twist that solves the problem in an interesting way. In a game, you might have that dozens of times. It's like yeah. it's like making a series of movies. One yeah. game is is you know like uh, Hogwarts Legacy. I believe that the the gameplay time to just get through the main story is eighty hours. So that's like forty movies. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so you have to just iterate over and over and give them give them lots of choices and and uh, make them feel like they're in control. Sometimes that's a myth. Sometimes you're, you, you need to make them feel like they're in control of it, but you don't actually have to let them be in control of it. You're, you can still control the story from behind the scenes, but you need to give, that, give the feeling to them that they actually are in control. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. difficult. And just to follow up on that, so what are the techniques and strategies that you use to make sure that players stay on the game and... Um, what is the level of personalization um, that players mm -hmm. can have? Well, what you have to do with any good story is you have to start out with a really good premise. You have to start out with a promise of an adventure and something very interesting that players are going to want to understand more deeply. Um, you know, the, the, the movie Avatar starts with a guy being sent off world and getting this avatar body so that he can go explore things. And then he falls in love with one of the natives that he meets when he's in his avatar mode. And it's a very simple premise, but it's something that people go, Oh, I want to see where this goes now, you know, because they don't have any idea. So you have to start with this really good promise. And then, then you spend the rest of the time with that pitch and you try to play it out in a way that's rewarding that people will understand. So um, I always tell people like, don't set up a story where the main character is deciding whether or not to kill a dragon if you're not gonna let them kill the dragon in the game, <laughs> because then you've set up this entire premise of they need to kill this dragon and then you can't pay it off. Change your premise, because if you don't, if you don't allow them to do the thing that is their like number one goal and you don't really resolve that it needs to change to a different goal it's it's very frustrating i've seen a lot of games fail because they have promised something that you can't actually pay off so yeah. um it's it's about that it's about adding a rich texture of the world with a lot of characters that you can interact with that tell different sides of the same story different perspectives and they they sort of flavor the experience um it's you know we don't live in a world anymore where you can play super mario brothers and go wow that was a really good story i think there was a time where people would have thought super mario brothers had a really good story but it's a plumber in a world filled with mushroom people like that's the entire story <laughs> that doesn't fly anymore you know you have to you have to do something a little more deep than that and so yeah game games have matured in a way that they're almost the same as films Mm -hmm. the the storytelling yeah. techniques are better and and uh, and i know you have some questions about this so i don't want to talk about it too much right now but um so you have to approach it a lot uh the same way mm -hmm. and i guess yeah. to, in that true. sense uh, like the game that came to mind as you were speaking adrian was uh, uncharted right um uh -huh. i love i love that game and i think one of the one of the things that kind of resonate in that storyline even though it's it's not necessarily something that um, I would say kind of is relatable, but um, the the journey of uh, the kid and his brother and kind of yeah. the struggles that they go through. Uh, I think, like you said, there is an implicit connection that a good story draws with the the player or the 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 audience um, that sometimes isn't necessarily or shouldn't necessarily be as explicit as um some writers would put it right sometimes it can yeah. be an implicit deep connection that you're looking to create with the player through that um through that story right absolutely uh one of the, one of the easiest techniques that we use in film and now games is using a lot too is set up some tragic backstory so you're going to feel bad for that character um one yeah. of the let me show you one of, the, one of the books that i tell my class to read when they're first starting out is save the cat which is a screenwriting uh, book it's it's not that thick, but I recommend it to everybody because it actually like shows you, you know, if somebody saves the cat in the first part of the story, then you're going to feel sympathy for them. 
for the entire rest of the movie. So it's like these these simple cheap techniques to get people yeah. to, to enjoy the the story. So uh, even in my in my game writing class that I'm doing right now, that's like the first book I tell people to read because mm -hmm. uh, it's just techniques to figure out how to make you care about the audience. So Uncharted is one of my favorite game series. So I love that example. But you're right. It's you know, you set up the story that makes them very relatable and very sympathetic. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And Sally, I know that uh, you work with gaming founders every day and you advise them when it comes to their pitches and to their startups. So what do you think is the role of storytelling when it comes to pitching ideas or startups to investors? Uh, I, I love that angle, Zabo, uh, uh, because I think today when specifically when we're talking about gaming founders, right? A lot of the people that you see pitching are uh, either game enthusiasts, so gamer turned founder, uh, mm -hmm. developer turned founder, um, and that kind of constitutes majority of uh, what, what we see out there, right? And I think somewhere along, along the way, they tend to forget about um, the impact of storytelling uh, brings, even in a business setting, like pitching your idea or pitching your, your startup. Um, and so one of the first things that we do in working with founders is we actually sit down and actually break down uh, their investor deck and saying, what is the story there, right? Sometimes as a, right. as a startup or as a founder, you end up being, um, you get too consumed putting out all of the facts, right? All of the fancy numbers, all of the features, uh, try to kind of make it as flashy as it can be. Uh, and at the end of the day, when you're pitching, similar to when you're putting out content or a game to an audience, you're still, your core goal is to create a connection with that person sitting on the other side. And if you're going to do that, you need to tell a story, right? The facts, Absolutely. the flashiness, all of these things kind of come, uh, they're inherent and they come secondhand, but at the core of it, what is it that you're standing up and saying that will allow people to buy into your cause or your mission? People people get very obsessed with the tech of games a lot. And and they'll say like, no, this is going to be a really cool, engaging experience because we're going to use this tech and it's going to be awesome. And I, I feel like I'm a little bit spoiled that I know better because I come <laughs> from the film industry. And when um, I'm old enough that I remember when Toy Story came out in the theaters because it was the first CG film, you cared that it was computer generated for about 10 minutes. And then if the story hadn't had, hadn't have been good, you would you, you would have been bored to tears. You would not have wanted to watch the whole movie, but the story is fantastic. Looking mm -hmm. back now, it's really rough looking tech because tech improves all the time, but yeah. it's still a beloved movie because it, the story I, I don't think you can make a good movie that has a bad story. I think you can make a, a bad movie that has a good story, but, but I don't think <laughs> you, you have to have a good story. Like you can have a tiny budget and if you put a good story in it, people will still want to see it, but yeah. you can have mm -hmm. a, a huge budget and a bad story and people aren't going to care about it whatsoever. And I think, yeah. you know, you see that a lot in games and film where they throw money at it to just make it this huge production, but they don't spend the time on the story to make it good. And nobody wants that. Like I, one of the, one of the most interesting examples to me now is Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild barely has any dialogue in yeah. it at all. And yeah. I think it's one of the most compelling stories in games. It has all this ambient storytelling. You're in Hyrule, you're just walking around having this adventure and everybody that plays it if you ask them what's the story they will tell you a completely different answer because it's entirely user user written it's it's yeah. crazy so you have to you have to find those ways to make the story compelling or else you just don't have a good product so i think it's right that mm -hmm. you like question people like yeah but what's the story because i think it's really important yeah definitely and definitely I, what i love about right what i love about games is that there is also a chance to be a protagonist and there is a chance to see the strength and flaws of the character, right? Yeah. And many people who are watching this episode now, they are probably gaming founders or the ones that have the idea and they're turning the idea into the story and the game later on. Uh, do you think there is a way to evaluate the story? And um, if there is one way, what that way is and how do you build the character 
and how do we make sure that that character has the strength and the flaws that people can relate to? Yeah, this is something I'm just about like tomorrow in my class is I'm, I'm going to go over this exact thing. So it's very fresh in my mind. Um, <laughs> you people make games a lot when where they don't give the the protagonist any flaws. They just make him the superhero that doesn't make mistakes. Mm. And you can do that, and it's a game, but you have to give them fatal flaws. You have to you have to put them in situations where you say, oh no, they were doing so well, and now they're facing their number one flaw. <laughs> How are they going to get through this? Um, yeah. I I look to myself a lot. You have to be very introspective about your your writing. Um, I, I tell this story all the time, so please, I apologize in advance, but um, I, five years ago, I actually shattered my drawing arm and ruined all the nerves in my drawing arm. And they told oh, me wow. I'd actually never draw or type again. And I uh, mm -hmm. could have chosen to be very upset and depressed about that. But instead, what I did was I found a physical therapist. We came up with a strategy. I can use my hand now. I type and draw all the time. And it took about eight months until I got it back to a level that I could be professional again. And wow. that's a story like that's That's my protagonist story. I had this mm -hmm. horrible thing happen to me and my character revealed whether or not I was going to let it beat me or if I was going to beat the problem. And so I, I look inside all the time, all the experiences I've had that I know everybody else has had similar experiences. Look inside yourself. What drives you? What have you overcome? and try to find a way to give that to your protagonist. It's very helpful. And then after that, once, you know, you don't want it to be too close to your own personal journey, but after you mm -hmm. get that layer put in, then you can develop it more and figure things out. But but I think everybody on this earth has come through this struggle. I mean, the two of you, what you're doing right now, I'm sure that you didn't just wake up one day and say, I wanna do this and it just worked fine, right? Like you, it took a lot of work to get to this point. And I think that's something that everybody can uh, can relate to. So just looking yeah. inside yourself and finding those qualities is what helps you make a good protagonist. This is so well, right. You know, I, Adrian, go ahead. Go ahead, Salim. Yeah, I was just going to say very quickly that I was doing creative writing for a little while, like a few years ago. And I remember my teacher saying that, Zebo, like you give the character all the all the superpowers and strength, but that is the flaw, right? Yeah. But now I think now reflecting back, I'm understanding that, yes, I should have uh, specified the flaws more because I think these are the things that makes us human. And yes. I think people are able to relate to that. So I think you, this is the case for games as well. You want to cheer for them to succeed. And you can't mm -hmm. do that if you don't give them any trial. You have to give them some That's tension true. and some trial. When they overcome something that you know is a problem for them, you're so happy for the protagonist. Yeah. So it's definitely important. Well, I think it's uh, it's interesting that you brought that up, Adrian. Uh, uh, a common, I think, uh, uh, I guess, conversation that we always have is um, a lot of a lot of what games are all about: stories, graphics. Uh, a lot of that is today it's art it's creativity right and art and creativity by nature is subjective right um mm -hmm. and so it's interesting to kind of even when we look at a company to evaluate whether it's for investment or so on um i think a common thought is how do you evaluate a good story knowing that creativity and art in essence uh, are subjective right and i think what you're what you're saying here is regardless of kind of the context of the story, the emotions at which um, these stories typically play at or the emotions that they look to trigger or evoke for the for the audience um, are, 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 are uniform in nature, right? Or they're universal yeah. in nature, I guess, right? Yes. That's, that's one of the, the principles that the Save the Cat book talks about a lot. It's so easy to understand if there's a cat in danger and somebody stops what they're doing and saves the cat, 99% of the world is going to go, oh, that's a nice person. And then your job is done. Like you now you just have to build a story around it. And you know, <laughs> there's one percent of people that won't think that, but we don't want to make games for them because that yeah. <laughs> like, they've got some problems. But yeah, you do something like that where you have a very sympathetic situation and the and your protagonist chooses to do something kind, you you've already set up that people are warm to this character and they want them to succeed. 
And then as you unravel it, you can like start there. And then as you unravel it, you can maybe discover they have some flaws. And, and then at that point, because you already sympathize with them, you'll say, well, that's too bad that they have that flaw. But remember when they saved the cat, they're a good person. So it, <laughs> it keeps, it's like an anchor you have hmm. to, to carry the audience through with you so that you can make some brave decisions about things. Yeah. I love that. And I, I think from my conversation with founders, uh, sometimes they find it very hard to strike a balance between stories and the gameplay and the monetization part of it. So maybe like Sally, what's your view on how storytelling can be integrated in these monetization strategies and how they can choose the, choose the strategy that works with the um, story better? Well, I think, I, I think the moment you start to look at it as a trade-off uh, mm -hmm. is when you're already on the wrong page, right? Um, it's not it's not necessarily a trade-off, right? Priority always goes towards delivering an enjoyable experience for the player, right? At mm -hmm. the end of the day, that is the core objective of, of any game. Um, and so focusing on the story and making sure that you're able to communicate something that your audience and your gamers are able to relate to, they're able to uh, draw a connection towards, becomes mm -hmm. your primary goal, right? And if you fail at that, no matter how great you are at monetization or customer acquisition, um, you're less likely to, to be able to signific uh, significantly uh, witness the growth that you want, right? But you nail that and then the rest kind of comes a lot, a lot easier for you because now you have a community that is engaged, you have a community that is loyal and they're coming back to your platform and they're coming back to your game. Um, and so it, it, you're, you're, you're making your job a lot easier by focusing on the story and focusing on delivering an enjoyable experience. And the rest mm -hmm. kind of follows, uh, follows that. And I think when we see founders kind of thinking of it as a, as a trade-off, um, you want to mm -hmm. be able to kind of step in and say it's, and clarify that it's not a, trade-off, right? I think specifically when you're talking about um, specific genres, right? So maybe not necessarily as much in AAA games or so on, but if you take a look at something like mobile games uh, that is heavily driven by um, in-game monetization ads and so on, uh, and you do see founders are um, can be a bit aggressive uh, on that front in terms of how do I kind of make the most out of this community? How do I make them pay more or more frequent, etc.? cetera? Uh, but even yeah. when you're talking about a casual game, uh, a, good, a good example of that um, uh, would be dream games, right? And how they go about developing some of their casual games. It's, it's, a, it's a very simple match three game, but there is, there is a story there. There's a king that's in distress and sometimes his room drowns or sometimes someone knocks at his door and he has a nightmare or whatever. <laughs> Um, but even though the activity that you're doing as a player is quite simple, you're simply matching gems and jewels, uh, but there is a story there and that story keeps you engaged and keeps you uh, tied up, essentially. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I love that. And I think I love the point about that there is no trade-off between monetization and earning money and the uh, mm -hmm. fun and the like, gameplay itself. And I think it leads to the part about dynamic storytelling because I feel like then if games adapt to our actions, preferences, and context, then we are able to provide a better experience for our um, players, right? So then I think that we all like when the game responds to our emotions and feedback. But I was wondering, Adrian, if you could tell us about some of the new kind of updates and technologies that are uh, enabling us to um, have this experience of dynamic storytelling? Mm -hmm. Well, probably the the biggest stretch in game making that I had was working on Hogwarts Legacy because we did a branching story. And mm -hmm. so we, when we were working on Disney Infinity, we would actually use Excel to write all the lines because wow. we could like wow. label the assets. <laughs> and well, they were mostly just barks, right? Like they yeah. were just you know, ow, don't hit me, or hi, Mickey, or things like that. But mm -hmm. when we, I got my eyes open a little bit when we made the Cars 3 video game, because we actually have an announcer that would do like a post-race wrap-up. And we actually stretched our technology a little bit by having 
four different things that he was going to talk about and they were randomized so you could actually have them all connect together. So we had to write them very carefully so they'd work, play one, two, three, four. So one would be, that was a good race. This is the one, the car that won. Number two would be, they did this trick, which is probably why they won. Number three would be, and then it made this character mad because they lost. And then the fourth line would be just a summary of the race. And so we wrote enough of those lines that it would never feel like the same announcer yeah. every single time. It was a hard work and I didn't do it, but a friend of mine did. And it was just this really eye-opening thing about even, even without branching dialogue, the things you could do to make your game feel more um, cohesive and relatable. And then when we started working on Hogwarts Legacy and we decided we were gonna make a branching dialogue game, we had to completely reinvent the way that we approach dialogue. We couldn't write it in Excel anymore because the amount of connections that you'd have to make were just ridiculous at that point. Like we would have, we're writers, we're not mathematicians. So we would not have been able to keep track of those things. So we found a really nice um, visual graphing software that mm -hmm. you could actually connect, you know, character says this line, connect to three choices that somebody can say, and then connect to like the, it's basically like coding. Like you, we'd actually became yeah. a little bit more of a design team because of that. And so once we got that in place, it, it helped a lot. But boy, there was a rough learning curve. So there's a lot of graphical uh, interface software that does things like that. A lot of them have free trials. So I'd encourage your listeners if they're looking to get into branching dialogue to to look those things up and and uh, give it a shot and see how those work because you just can't you can't write a script and you can't write, write an excel to do branching dialogue not if you're going to have any sort of robustness to it and the software yeah. we found actually worked with unreal which is what the engine that we used to make our game so we could actually plug it right into unreal it was it was pretty slick mm -hmm. oh adrian and as you're uh, speaking about kind of the challenges that you guys uh, go through i think as audiences become more sophisticated, that how stories are approached and how storylines are approached, I think obviously also needs to become uh, more sophisticated. And I think you've you've drawn a good example from your experience at at, at Cars here. Uh, but curious to kind of know from a landscape perspective, looking at a function within a game studio that is heavily led by creators, right? They're writers, they're designers, mm -hmm. animators, et cetera. Um, where do you kind of see the role of technology in terms of today's challenges, right? If you were, uh, if you had a magic wand to, to, to spin and say, I would love these problems to be solved uh, in the in the storytelling or the story writing um, space in, in, in gaming, what would that be? I would think that the, the biggest thing that I'm currently trying to figure out how to do more easily is to write our dialogue and have it played back in the game so we can test it to see if everything's working right. We're, we're so close to finding a way to write the dialogue, put meta tags in it so that the performance mm. on the character will work correctly so that we can test it out. Um, a lot of people are really convinced that AI is going to be the thing that gets us there. I do not agree with that at all because AI doesn't have a soul like it. It can't make something artful. It can just make something. And so I don't I don't feel like that's the answer. And I hope your podcast doesn't get hate for me saying that. But uh, uh, every time somebody comes and says like, hey, what if we replace the writing team with AI? I'm like, then you'll have a horrible game. So, uh, you know, yeah. it's it's just not the same. And anybody that has a little bit of craft to them or a little bit of knowledge about the way things work can spot AI a mile away. Like mm. it's it's not good. But there's other things like, can I write dialogue, put an emotion tag on the dialogue and then have a generative dialogue thing, just give us some temporary, a temporary version yeah. of that line that's mm -hmm. good enough that we can pitch it to the company and have them understand what we're trying to go for with the line. One of the biggest problems we had on the last game was um, we had, we call them robo voice and it could we could give have it say the line but it would never put any inflection on it like it wouldn't act it would just say the line and then we'd show it to the team and they'd say well how am i supposed to feel for this character because as writers we can understand what we're going for and what the final performance will sound like 
but we actually mm-hmm. can't get other people to understand how that performance is going to be. Yeah. They don't, yeah. they don't just trust that we know what we're doing. They want to actually see it played out. And so we ended up doing a lot of sessions with a temporary actor who just went mm. through one take lines and just read all the lines and we plugged them into their our game as a temporary solution. So I'd like mm-hmm. to figure out a way to do that, not as a final product, but as a way to test out uh, our performance yeah. better. I see that. I love that. And, Super insightful. Mm-hmm. And like going back to what you mentioned about branching dialogue. So when you were talking, I remembered about um, brain computer interfaces. So a few, um, a few days ago, we had an episode with Mike, who is the pioneer in game psychology. And he mm-hmm. mentioned that this technology of um, brain computer interfaces, they allow um, they allow for like they can predict the internal state of the player, right? And I was thinking that if in the future this technology happens to be quite like happens to go viral, in that case, for example, if I am about to stop the game because I'm bored, then these uh, BCIs will detect it and they will change the narrative of the game for me to be able to stay and make it interesting, right? So I was wondering to get your take on how would technologies like this or biometric or biosensors that can kind of like understand humans on a much different level than what we know now, how how are this able to change the um, way how writers will uh, write games in the future? Yeah. So this is not a new idea to me because I think we've actually been doing that in games for quite a while, just in a more primitive manner. For example, on, Disney, on the first Disney Infinity, we had a level with Buzz Lightyear that was ridiculously difficult. And so it, we actually put some, some coding in the game so that if you failed at it three times, then it would make it about 10% easier. And if you failed another three times, then it would make it 10% easier until you could finally pass the level because it was really hard, but taking it out would have destroyed the experience of the game. And so I think it's it's in, it's a very similar theory, like how to, how to change the game so that you can engage the player longer. Um, at the level mm-hmm. that he's referring to, I I feel like we're still at that sort of like there, there's a there's a wall there where good writing is still needed. And so do we do we write another version of the game that for that change? It it could be a yes, but I don't think AI can can manage that level of data. Like I I just don't think it will feel rewarding to people. But we can find ways to be creative with the writing so that it it can work and change slightly. One of the biggest things that we have a problem with is um, audio has has two hurdles that they have to handle. Number one, there has to be enough room on the disc for the audio, or it has to be a small enough download size for the game consoles to be willing to let you have a, a digital purchase. And number two, when you when you localize or translate it into other languages, mm-hmm. it becomes prohibitively expensive. And we would write um, like one of the worst games to me from a dialogue perspective is Skyrim because they have like one line that repeats over and over for all these different characters, and it drives me absolutely insane. So <laughs> we would write three to five lines for a different situation, and over the course of time, first when they found out what the budget was going to be for our localization team, we had to cut that down. And then when we found out how much disk space space they were going to allow for the audio, we had to cut it down even more. So I think that there's, there's something that needs to change there a little bit, whether it's, you know, put the audio in a patch that you download later or, or something, but I'm not quite sure how to um, bridge that gap to give more variety to the game from a dialogue perspective. It's a very tough problem to solve. Yeah, I see that. And I think many founders who are right now listening to this episode, they really would like to learn how to develop their writing and how to become better uh, storytellers. So in that Mm -hmm. case, do you recommend any, do you have in mind any books or resources that you would like to recommend those uh, founders uh, so that they can go and enhance their writing skills and when it comes to the application to gaming. So I I definitely feel strongly that I would not tell them to buy books on narrative design 
because in order to be a good game writer, you have to be a good writer first. So yeah. Save the Cat is the number one book I recommend to people. And then there's another book that I have. Um, do I have it here? Yeah, here it is. <laughs> it's called The Writer's Journey. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it takes uh, classic movies from the 1980s and it dissects them to tell you why they're appealing. Yeah. Both of those books are really good. Um, you can, if you understand game design, you can take any writing, uh, writing information and apply it to games. Okay, but I would, I would say definitely just find really good books on writing. Um, there's another book, um, The Hero's Journey, and um, mm -hmm. script by Robert McGee is really good. Um, but, but I just tell them to focus on writing books, not not game writing books because game writing is this whole other discipline. But if you're not a good writer to begin with, it doesn't matter what, what you learn about game writing. Um, I think there's, if you remember the movie Ratatouille, the kind of the, the, the lesson that you learn from that movie, the moral is that not that anybody can be a great cook, but a great cook can come from anywhere. And I think it's the same with writing. I think when they wrote that movie, they knew what they were talking about. Um, <laughs> you, you may have absolutely zero experience in the writing discipline, but if you apply yourself and you're very analytical and very creative, you can become mm -hmm. an amazing writer. So I would tell yeah. them, don't get, don't get frustrated. Absorb books. Read as much as you can. Write as much as you can. Share your writing with other people and get their feedback. That's the scariest part. You did. Here's yes. my soul. Can you tell me what's wrong with it? So, uh, but but I think those are the best practices to becoming a good writer. If you live in a community that has a writer's group, become a part of that writer's group. Just learn the craft better. And the craft is writing, not game writing. Yeah. Well, Thanks I guess for it's that. also, uh, I mean, story, story, storytelling is inherent to us as humans, right? This, it's how you tell your friends uh, gossip and news, etc. So I like what you said <laughs> that good writing can come can come out of everyone if you do apply yourself. And I think Absolutely. kind of uh, yeah. staying true to those fundamentals. Yeah, Absolutely. that that's true. And talking about the resources, I'm very happy to share that uh, Adrian actually has is teaching a class, and you can just check out the website here. It's called Elevator. And just to give you a little bit more of the context about the class, it's 12 classes and they teach you everything from writer's role in game development to um, building relatable characters and dialogues. And I think this course will also equip you to find those strengths and flaws that we discussed in the podcast. And it will help you to find the voice of each character better. So go ahead and check out this class. And I think the next cohort will start in November. Right, Adrian? Yes, um, yes, November 7th. Yeah. That's great, and, yes. And then, you know, one of the things that I want to mention about the class is I make myself very available to my students. There's a Discord channel, and I'm on that Discord channel answering questions about four hours a day. So wow. if you have, if you, if you take the course and you have questions or need a little bit more guidance, career guidance or, or writing guidance, I'm usually around to answer the questions. It's a really fun class. That's amazing. And also as people who are watching this episode, you are very lucky because uh, Adrian gave us uh, a promo code. So it's basically a 10% discount and just try the game on podcast, get game on with capital letters uh, in the application and you will be able to access um, this uh, class and application. Um, unfortunately, I think Amazing. the time uh, is here and we will end the episode here. Adrian, oh, Sally, it was great talking to you. Same we can, here. I think for the next five, ten hours we can, but I think, yeah, I think it so really too. gave insights to our founders about how to write uh, better games and how to find the voice of the characters and also how to find the flaws and the strength. It was very interesting talking to you and hopefully we will bring you again soon for our next episodes because I'm sure after watching this episode, founders will have many, many questions about writing as well. <laughs> I would love to come back. That would be great. 
That's Thank amazing. you so much, Thank Adrian. You. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me.